by ClubWWI.com members. I'm standing by this week with a gentleman uh, who you know by name. You actually know by more than one name because the success that he achieved in wrestling uh, is actually more uh, than you would expect from the name that he used because, well, he has a famous last name, but he also has a famous tag team name. Uh, he's all about cool, and he carved his own path. Folks, the one and only Deuce himself, Mr. Sim Snuka. Sim, how are you? I'm good, man. Appreciate uh, having me on. No, no, I gotta tell you, right from, from the beginning when I said, uh, it's actually true because you're one of those guys that I, I hear so often from fans, you know, uh, that they love the gimmick that you play, they love the character that you play, they, they wish that it would have lasted longer, but before we get into any of that, I want you to let people know how things are by you and, and what's going on in the world of Sim Snooker right now. Well, you know, after uh, I got released from uh, WWE, well, I guess I should say before I got released, um, you know, it was kind of slow for me uh, being on TV and stuff like that. So uh, one of the things I've been doing um, in the meantime, I've been training young athletes. That's something I've been doing probably as a hobby for maybe a little over 10 years. Okay. And uh, just when I say training young athletes, it was like... Um, getting them faster, stronger, increase their vertical quicker, that kind of stuff. And um, so I've just kind of been doing that on the side. And then when things got slower with, uh, you know, being on the road and stuff towards the end there, is uh, I just kept doing that more and more. And so that's that's kind of what I had been doing in the meantime. And then just uh, I just started getting back on the independence and, you know, letting people know that I'm, I'm out there doing shows and stuff. So... Man. That's what I've been doing in the meantime. Well, I mean, for you too. I think a lot of times we interview people who you know come from wrestling families, and one of the things that that it always kind of strikes me is that it seems like they're a lot more mature beyond their years in terms of you know what they do in the ring because it's the kind of thing that you know a lot of guys say, "Well, I live wrestling," but I mean, you literally you know lived wrestling being a, being a second generation star. Yeah, it was uh, it's definitely a, a quick education on life and. You know, what not to do and, and all of that stuff growing up, uh, you know, watching, watching your dad, you know, go through it and traveling on the road with him and everything like that. It, uh, it's, it's a totally different life. I mean, it is, it is the circus, you know, growing up like that. Yeah. A lot of things too, I think, that surprise a lot of young wrestlers are maybe not so much of a surprise for you. Like, I know a lot of guys, you know, they figure out, well, I have to do this in the ring and that in the ring, but they never think about, you know, how to handle yourself backstage or some of the things that I'm sure you kind of learned about uh, before a lot of guys your age learned about when they got to WWE. Yeah, I mean, man, I can't remember the first time I was in the locker room. I, I just, you know, I just remember I, I'd be in, in school and, uh, you know, my dad would have to drive somewhere and uh, he'd be like, you want to go? Yeah, I'll go and... You know, so I just go on the road and, you know, you get that first-hand experience uh, backstage of uh, growing up with the guys and, you know, having them rib you, you know, tease you or whatever and, and just see the way that they interact with each other and then, you know, the way that they, you know, put their matches together, the way they talk to each other. It was, it, it, it really helped out a lot when I finally did decide to get in the business. It really helped me with, uh, you know, just a lot of understanding um, you know, things that I wouldn't have otherwise known had I not had that first-hand experience, you know, right there next to my dad and, you know, riding with him in the car and all of that, that other stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's the kind of thing where I know a lot of guys, they say that, and it's almost in your blood, like you kind of feel like, you know, being around it so long that by the time it's time to figure out what you, what you want to do, uh, you know, as an adult, a lot of guys, they say, that, you know, I don't, I don't choose wrestling, wrestling chooses me. That's exactly what happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because I, 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 was, I was one of those, um, you know, a lot of guys will say they, they always wanted to wrestle, they always knew. See, for me, it was the total exact opposite. Um, growing up uh, in the business and, and seeing the way that it was, I, I stayed as far away from the wrestling business as I could. Okay. I mean, I, I had no desire whatsoever to get in the business. Um, and, and that was for a couple of reasons. I mean... One, it's very hard on a family life. You know, my dad was always gone, traveled a lot, and, uh, you know, just seeing, you know, the hardships that come with that, you know, growing up with my sisters and my mom and being home and, you know, just trying to go to football games and baseball games and, you know, it's just, it's just me there, you know, wanting, 
your dad to be there or whatever. You know, any any kid, you know, feels feels like that. So I I knew it was rough, and so I I just stayed as far away from it as I could. And then um, I was actually working two jobs, and uh, one day my, my you know my dad came down and visited me, and uh, he saw you know how how hard I was working with the two jobs and how early I'd have to get up and then go to sleep and all of that, and then uh, I was really, uh, there was a guy that worked at the TV station that I was working at, and he was a huge wrestling fan, and he used to, that was during the time when wrestling was really hot, like in, um, was that like 96? Yeah, I right? yeah, the attitude time. Right? Yeah, all of that. So, you know, he was so excited about it, and he'd, he'd uh, videotape it every week, and he'd bring the videotapes in, and uh, he'd, he'd be like, he'd, so you know, you got to see what they did last night. Oh, you got to see this. Or, you know, you got to see what your cousin did this time. And so he played these these clips for me, and I just started getting so excited about it. And the more and more I thought about it, uh, I mean, the more I just felt like, you know, that it's it's something I I should go and do. It's like um, you ever been doing one thing and you feel like you should be doing something else? Yeah, be thinking about it, you're daydreaming about it and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, how about yourself, though? Have you ever felt like that? Oh, yeah, no, I have. Yeah, absolutely. See, and, and that's that's exactly what happened to me. Man. I just, I was doing one thing and I just, uh, I knew, I was like, man, I, I need to be doing something else. And so I basically picked up the phone and called my dad and said, hey, I want to get in the business. Will you train me? And he said, all right, quit your jobs and move up here to, to New Jersey. So I was living in Salt Lake City at the time, and uh, I quit my jobs. And within a few weeks, I moved up to Jersey, you know, left my uh, my family back in Salt Lake and went up to Jersey and started training with my dad. Man. That had to be, I mean, and with 22, I mean, real quick, I don't, I don't mean to jump off path, but one of the things I, I found funny reading about was that you were a cameraman. Uh, before, you know, a TV cameraman, before getting into wrestling. Is that right? Or <laughs> That's right. But is it for yeah. you? But then watching, what I always thought, you know, when I first read that, I thought it must have been for you maybe watching some of your matches. Like, were you critiquing some of the camera work too in your head? Because it's kind of a rare crossover to do. You probably thought, you know, uh, that wasn't positioned right or maybe they missed the shot. Or I mean, did you did you find yourself doing that sometimes too? Yeah, I, I, I would find myself actually talking to the cameraman like when I was in developmental or... Um, you know, just even even up at WWE, just trying to you know make sure you know certain shots would be there for certain things, and so yeah, yeah, it was it was it was a different transition, but but helped out in some ways as well. Absolutely. And, but when you went to go train, I had read, uh, you know, I know one of the earliest uh, jobs that you had was with a company that I was actually just talking about with all the stuff with TNA and Hogan and Jimmy Hart and, and things like that. I was talking about the XWF, uh, which was, I guess, one of the, the earliest companies that you worked for, the, the Jimmy Hart company, when, when you were uh, with your dad there. Yeah, yeah, that was, shoot, that was a great opportunity. Uh, you know, and when it started up, man, I, I was so excited for that. Um, just because I'd never been on, you know, anything that big before. And, and everybody was excited about it, you know, hoping that it was gonna, it was gonna take off. And they had big plans and had, uh, you know, big desires to do big things. And then it just, you know, it just never took off. I, you know, I'm not sure exactly what happened and why it fizzled out. But yeah, that would have, it would have been a great opportunity for a lot of guys. But I guess, you know, a lot of what they were trying to do, you know, TNA's already, uh, you know, taken off and done it. Um, plus, I think when when that got started, uh, the XWF, I think it also helped um, with uh, WWE, and, and that's kind of about the time they started using some of the older talent again. Mm-hmm. You know, trying to bring, trying to like merge the two with all the young talent that they had going on, and then bring back some of the old school stuff. And I think it helped the business out that way too. Well, that was, I mean, that time period, you know, especially when your when your dad was around. I always talk about how guys could have wrestled for three weeks in WWF in the 80s, and people remembered them for years and years and years. And sometimes today you have to really be out there for a long time to, to be remembered. It was almost like a different bond that, that some of them had with that with the audience in a quick amount of time. Yeah, I think it's just that, you know, a huge connection thing. I mean, you, you figure... 
the way that the locker room is now, you know, there's so many young guys in the locker room, and there's not so many veterans in the locker room. Mm-hmm. Whereas back then it was full of veterans, and the young guys was the minority. You know, and mm-hmm. now, and so when you had these young guys coming up, you had all these veterans in the locker room from the top of the card, even to the bottom of the card in some cases. And so they just, you know, they knew what to do. They knew how to connect to the crowd and they knew how to teach that to the younger guys. And now, um, you know, when you only have a handful of veterans that truly know the business and know what they're doing, it, it, it's a little bit harder for, for us younger guys coming in there trying to, you know, connect with the crowd and, and understand what we really need to do out there just because, you know, the business has is, is changed in so many ways from back then. Oh, absolutely. It just it feels like sometimes uh, it's kind of a different setup in a way. I mean, I remember, you know, in the 80s again, you know, everyone talks about Lex Luger. He turned, you know, turned from good guy to bad guy once a year, once every two years, and they said it was too much. And now sometimes it feels like today guys do it every month. They go from, you know, I'm bad, I'm good, I'm bad, I'm good, and it's hard to keep up. Yeah, and I wonder sometimes how the fans feel about that, you know, that, that switching back and forth, uh, so much. I mean, I know, you know, they're trying to do the ratings and trying to, um, you know, have the TV shows be good and all of that. So, you know, we live in such a fast paced world right now where everybody wants everything instantly and, mm-hmm. you know, uh, the wrestling business no different with that, so. I don't know, it's, it's probably a lot harder for the fans to, to really, like you were saying earlier, connect and, and really have that, you know, imprint on their mind, that longevity of, of somebody that they remember because, you know, the, the connection is just not there much today. Absolutely. When you, when you went to OVW, and I thought this was one of, I mean, honestly, I don't know, you know, how much you had to do with this or what, I thought it was one of the coolest things, uh, ever. I mean, to go in there as, as Jimmy Snicker's son, and to not be Jimmy Snooker Jr. right off the bat when you came in, they had brought you in, and they not only gave you a gimmick, they gave you probably what was my favorite gimmick out of WWE in the last 10 years, that the Greasers gimmick uh, from the 50s. What, was there any talk when you first came in about being you know, uh, Jimmy Snooker's offspring right off the bat, or, or was this the kind of thing, the whole Deuce uh, Shade, I guess it was the original one, Deuce Shade gimmick, uh, you know, who pitched that to you, and, and was, was that the original idea, or were you going to actually be, uh, be the second-generation star as soon as you showed up? No, no, not at all. Okay. Um, actually, when I when I started wrestling, I um, you know I, I have to go back when when I started training and stuff. I I didn't want to wrestle um, like my dad. I, that was just I was so uncomfortable with it, and uh, like I'd be in a in a match or I'd be practicing or whatever, and and people would call out. You know, they'd want me to do spots or do things that my dad did, like the headbutt and do the chops, and it just, it didn't feel natural to me. Mm -hmm. I was totally uncomfortable with it. So when I finally, when it was time to have my first match, it was probably three months later, I I didn't know what to go as. So because I didn't have anything, I just wanted Jimmy Snooker Jr. Mm -hmm. And um, I was in a tag match with me and my dad, and... I, I, I could I can't tell you how uncomfortable I was. Wow. It, it just it, it didn't feel good to me. So in my second match, I changed my name to well, I, I don't even remember what my name was in my second match. I just I totally dropped the whole snooker thing and just went as somebody else. Okay. And I I felt so comfortable. I was like this is great. And I was a heel in the match, and so it, it felt great. So I I knew that. Okay, if I'm gonna do something in this business, I, I can't wrestle as my dad's son. Not at first, anyway. Mm-hmm. So I tried to stay away from it as much as I can, um, and then, you know, try to fast forward to OVW. So when I got to um, OVW and developmental, um, Vince had actually mentioned something to me before I got there about not not using the Snooker name. That you know, he's like, you know, kind of do your own thing, and I was totally happy with that i was very cool with that i was like yeah that sounds exactly like what i was thinking Mm -hmm. so when i went there um i actually you know used a different name and um stayed away from the snooker thing and i was in developmental for a while it maybe been a year or so maybe longer i I forget now It, it was about a year or year and a half and i hadn't 
you know, gotten any opportunities to go up to TV or anything, and I was getting frustrated. And um, my partner, Domino, he was actually doing um, a gimmick. is uh, like an Andrew Dice gimmick. Yeah, yeah. And um, so I saw him do that, and I asked him about his gimmick. And, you know, he was actually great on the mic. He was still great on the mic. He, he could he could talk like nobody's business. And when I asked him about his gimmick, he, you know, I said, explain it to me. You know, what's his gimmick about? And he told me about, you know, Andrew Dice Clay. And he said, you know, Andrew Dice Clay, his gimmick or the, his stand-up and all of that was based on, on greasers. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of his thing. And, I, and when I heard that greasers, it just stuck in my head. And then I thought about that for probably the next week. And then Domino and I used to work out together. And I and I pitched the idea, and I said, you know, I think that idea of greasers is a great idea. And then, you know, he threw his ideas in. And so it, it was actually our idea. Oh, wow. The greaser thing. We, we came up with it. And uh, so it was just he and I, and, you know, we kind of just started building this thing. And I, I, I told him, you know, think about it for a few weeks. And then he came back to me and said, yeah, let's do it. And so we started getting, you know, jeans and a white T-shirt, and we just threw it all together and, and just ran with it. Man. I, you know what? i, I got to tell you that. A gimmick like that, what I loved about it, and it, it reminded me a little bit of the Honky Tonk Man, but what I, it was, I think, my favorite gimmick of all time. But what I love about a gimmick like that is that there's so many things that you can incorporate. I mean, you were able to bring the car in. You had Cherry. It, it was, it's one of those gimmicks that you can kind of reach out and, and bring new people in. I mean, Honky Tonk had, you know, Peggy Sue, and it kind of seemed like you guys could just it, – it's a gimmick that can keep getting other people over. It had a whole world that, that you could do with it. Yeah, there was uh, – and, man, if you've ever – if you've ever able to see some of the tapes and stuff that we did in OVW, I mean, there was so much that we did with it. You know, we went so far different ways with it. And, I, and like you were saying, I wish there was more that we could have done up at WWE with it. I mean, we didn't even, uh, you know, scratch the surface with, with what some of the stuff that we had done and could do. You know, there's so much more that we, we did with interviews and on the mic and then plus in our matches. I mean, we used to take Cherry's skate off and we used to hit people with it. Oh, you know, that, that'd be the finish of the match. And there's just... We had so much fun with it. It was a, you know, a great, uh, a great blessing. I, I have to say for us when we came up with it, just because we had so much fun doing it. And uh, you know, I don't know. I felt so comfortable in that character. You know, just growing up watching The Outsiders, the movie, and Grease, and all of that. You know, that was kind of our time. So it, it, uh, it was a lot of fun, man. So much fun. Well, that was, I think, and when you guys debuted, because I just watched this morning, I rewatched your, your debut on SmackDown, which, before we even get to the debut, i got to say, your theme song, probably the best theme song they've had in, in 10 years. I, I, there was something about it. It was it, it fit the mood. It had the whole game. I mean, when you guys first heard the song from, uh, I guess that was, that was Jim Johnson, right, who had done the song for you? I believe so. Yeah, I mean, that was, and between that and the entrance, it kind of seemed, and that's what surprised me, was that, it seemed right off the bat like you guys were going to go to the moon. I mean, you had a manager, you had a car, you had this great theme song, and, and a gimmick that even in your debut they had said, uh, you know, the idea was that it was your girlfriend and, and Domino's sister, so it seemed like there was, you know, so many places to go with that. It just seemed like so much potential right off the bat in WWE. Yeah, we were hoping so. I mean, and they did give us some great opportunities, no doubt. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, we probably... Uh, one of the things is that we should have taken better care of our own business, you know, because it, it, it is a business, you know, whether you're doing a character, you know, in the ring and all of that, it's, you got to take care of what it is that you're supposed to be doing. And I think sometimes, uh, we, we could have done a better job of that, but yeah, they, they give us some great opportunities, uh, with the car and stuff. I mean, that was, that was actually their idea when, when they were talking about having us come up there. They were like, yeah, we want to have you guys, you know, come up, come out in a car and, and do all of that. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I take that back. That was actually Domino's idea. He mentioned okay. that to them, and then they went with it. Okay. So, and uh, with the song, we, we actually, when we first heard the song, we were like, this is terrible. This is never going to happen. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, cause you, you get those first impressions because 
uh, the song we had in developmental was a it was a Brian Setzer song and it was fast beat, really you know quick fifties style music and it you know just moved. So when you heard it, it, it just went. And then when we heard that song that they they made for us, we're like, what? <laughs> it was too slow. And then probably I want to say I don't I don't know how long it took it, maybe three or four times, something like that, but. Uh, we come back and everybody's man, I love your guys' song. I love your guys' song. And then the fans and the, so I was like, okay, I guess, I guess it works then. So, yeah. yeah, you know, that's, that's the, that's the great thing about having all these, you know, professionals and having all these people around you is, you know, you, you might think something works and, uh, you know, you might be wrong and you got these other people, you know, helping make decisions and stuff. So it, it was a, it was a good, it was a good choice for us because it worked, it worked really well. And it was one of those things too. I mean, it was so different than anybody else's theme song that as soon as you heard it, you knew, you know, who, who was coming out when it went. So even the, the opening bars were enough to kind of, you know, let you know who was up next. Right. Yeah. You guys, I mean, you guys had a chance too. I mean, during during your time on uh, on SmackDown, which I, another thing that I had just seen recently, you, you had a chance to, you know, you I think you tag with your dad, but wrestle your dad on a pay per view. Which I remember this is before they had come out of the closet, so to speak, with you being Jimmy Snooker's son. So they, they played it straight and almost felt like for a lot of the fans who were in the know, it almost felt like a little Easter egg for them, the fact that it was you and Domino against uh you know, Jimmy Snooker and Sergeant Slaughter on pay per view. I, I think was it was it Night of Champions maybe or Vengeance or something like that. Uh yeah. It must have been amazing for you to get to wrestle your dad on, on a pay per view. Yeah, that was man, I can't even tell you how huge that was for me to be in WWE and to be in a match with my dad, um, you know, and then, uh, I mean, uh, when I came backstage, I, I couldn't thank Vince and Stephanie enough um, for that opportunity just because, you know, I, I, I know that they, they made that happen. And, uh, you know, had they not uh, wanted to see that or, or, you know, whatever the feeling was on that, it, it never would have happened. So, you know, i got to be so grateful to them for, you know, giving me that opportunity to be in, be in the ring with him on that type of a stage. Because, you know, I, I had a blast. I got to make fun of him and, you know, climb up the ropes and try to do his super fly splash and miss it. And, you know, so it was it was amazing. Yeah, yeah definitely a highlight of my career. Um, so, yeah, I loved it a lot. I mean, cool. I mean, that was that whole night was just for I me mean, for you guys right beforehand. I think uh, you, know, you had Tony Gurria and Rick Martel in the crowd, and you got to have uh, you know the two of you guys. Not only did you get to wrestle your dad and Sergeant Slaughter, but you had to get to to make fun of uh, Gurria and Martel before you went out there. It was just probably like reliving you know your youth now as an adult, and here you are in the ring, and you get to interact with you know all these guys who you know you, you were around as a kid. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's funny too because you know when I had first gotten up there, you know, and then. They always want to grab me and tell me stories, you know. Mm-hmm. They're, they're, yeah, I remember when your dad did this, or I remember when you used to do this, and, you know, Tony Gurria is no different. And, uh, you know, so to be in the ring and interact with them, and I think the other fun thing, too, is, you know, my partner, uh, Domino, was, was a huge wrestling fan. And so, you know, he'd been watching wrestling all his life, and, and so for him to be able to get on the mic and do all of that and tease them and, you know, make fun of them and then, you know, to, to do that in the ring. You know, you just, uh, a lot of times, you know, people just don't get to have opportunities like that, and we did, and it was exciting, very exciting for us, a lot of fun. Absolutely. Do you still, do you still keep in contact with Domino today? I've, I've talked to him a few times. I we, He's a he's a kind of a private guy a little bit. You know, he, he likes to do his own thing, so... You know, we we have talked and stuff, and we're still good friends. And you know, we, um, you know, we've done a few things, uh, you know, since since the breakup and all of that. But you know, he's just uh, he's just trying to do his own thing now. So no, absolutely. I mean, he's one of those guys. I think it's the both of you. Because this is what's funny, and I don't know if if you're near a computer or use a computer. Anytime I, I search for let's say your theme song or images, because we make the graphics for the thing, I, I look for images. And you go to the pages that have either videos of you guys or images of you guys. Uh, there's always these comments underneath, and everybody that I read about wants to see you guys back because it kind of feels the same way as I said that it was almost unfinished in a way. And it, and it felt weird that when you guys were actually split up and sent to different brands, 
Uh, I think a lot of people were surprised. I mean, how, how did you find out about the split? I mean, how did you feel about it, and uh, and was it a surprise for you? Um, it was it was not really a big surprise, uh, probably because during our work and and while we were going, we knew it it, it had gotten stale. Like it just there wasn't that same excitement there. Um, you know, not just with us in our matches or um, the creative side. It, it just wasn't the same, the same kind of uh, enthusiasm, I guess, from the creative, creative team and, and and us as well. And not for lack of trying. I mean, we were we were trying to do all we could with it, but it, it just wasn't going anywhere. So when um, you know they had talked about switching brands or, or have, have me go to the brand, the, to Raw and, you know, split us up, you know, I wasn't really that surprised. Mm-hmm. Um, but did I want it to keep going? Yeah, that would have been great if, you know, we would have had, uh, you know, a little bit longer run with it because, like I was saying earlier, there's so much we could have done with it, you know. There's a lot further we could have gone. I mean, because we had so much fun doing it. We, we did it for about a year in developmental and um, just had a blast with it. So, you know, we were ready to go. By the time they, they called us up to TV, we were ready to just run with it and felt like, you know, it was going well, and then it just kind of kind of dropped off there for a little bit. Yeah. Well, what really I think it's surprising to a lot of people is that when this used to happen, uh, you know, when, when a gimmick would end or when somebody would leave, it was because, you know, they never really went up the ladder too far. But, I mean, you guys jumped up the ladder. You were tag team champions very soon that it, that I think that was what surprised people the most if you were a tag team that kind of showed up and didn't do much and then split it would be one thing but I mean you were you were the hottest ticket on Smackdown you were the champions in almost record time yeah I think it was maybe five months mm-hmm. five months after we got on on Smackdown something like that and Kendrick and London had, had been they'd been champions for I think over a year or something like that mm-hmm. yeah like a mile yeah so yeah it was yeah it's it's different like that sometimes you know in, in our business where uh, you, you never you never know what it is that they they want sometimes it's the kind of uh like you think you know what you need to do and then you know it, it changes it's a it's a quick changing business especially up there no exactly well, I think one of the things, too, from watching you guys split, I mean, I think a lot of people figured when they saw, you know, I mean, you guys had almost identical gimmicks that as a tag team works, but to be on different brands, you, you kind of figured when you heard that was happening that, that one of you, if not both of you, was going to be changing kind of your characters a little bit. I mean, did that go through your mind when, when you got flipped over? Like, I guess it's only a matter of time before I'm, I'm playing a different character now? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I mean, I always, I always knew that I couldn't stay... Uh, not Snooker's son on TV for very long. I always knew that that had to come out at some point, and I was okay with it. I was like, all right, you know, I I know that this is there. Um, you know, I'm going to do this deuce thing, have a lot of fun, take it as far as it can go, and then, you know, when the time comes for uh, for them to say, all right, you're Snooker's son, and let that out, you know, I'll be all right with it. But I I, I felt like I needed to. Um, I needed to do it off myself without my name, though. First, mm-hmm. yeah, that's that's really what I felt. It because I I just felt like you know so many um, guys can will come in they'll use their name, which is fine. There's you know they they got to do what they need to do or what they feel is best for them. But for me, I didn't feel like it was a good idea to use my name up front. I, I wanted to see if I could make it without using my name and get there first, and then okay, now that I'm there, let's let's use the name. I mean, there must have been also a lot of veterans, too, who respected that. Because a lot of people, you know, to be able to achieve it on your own, it's one thing to, you know, come in and, and automatically have the right name recognition on day one. But you kind of work your way until you have it. You know, for a lot of people, they respect that. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I, I appreciate, you know, mm-hmm. the, the fans, the, the people that have taught me. Um, you know, there have been so many guys that have uh, I helped mold me in, into – you know, as far as training and just helping me understand the business and what would be best for me. So I think that that's that's where a lot of that understanding came from before I ever got there. Yeah. Now, when you became Sim Snooker, I think one of the things, I mean, you guys obviously had that big 
angle where, where legacy was created. And it was, you know, you and, and Manu and, and Cody Rowe and all these different people trying to, to get into the group. Uh, and I think a lot of people expected a longer fuse. I think in the end, you know, you and Manu didn't get in, and then it kind of got formed with Orton and DiBiase and Rhodes. And a lot of people were expecting almost a long-term feud. Were, were you surprised at kind of how quickly that ended, and, and were there any original plans to, to maybe take it further uh, between the, uh, the five of you guys? You know, it, it's hard to know how far they wanted to go with it because, you know, they they don't tell you a whole lot as far as all of that goes. And um, I was surprised, though, you know, that it ended so quickly. I mean, it, you know, you, you knew when they were doing it it was going to be huge because, you know, Randy being a huge star already and, and just being connected with him and being able to work with him, you, you knew that was going to be a huge thing, so... Yeah, when it ended, it was like, oh, man, that sucks. So, but, you you know, I mean, now they're they're off and running, and, you know, the thing that they're doing is huge, and, you know, that's good for them. Yeah, so absolutely. I'm happy for those guys. I think, I think a lot of people, too, were surprised that in the end, I mean, we talked about what, what a hot team you guys were and, you know, how, how high up you were, and in the end, here we are, and, you know, all three of you are no longer there, which I think surprised a lot of people because, you know, I mean, it's one thing that one fall through the cup, but you, Domino, and Cherry, I mean, are you surprised, you know, not necessarily about yourself, but about the fact that they didn't take any remnants of the group at all and maybe try to spin the gimmick off? I mean, it was, it was a hot gimmick to be able to maybe spin it off, give it to, give it to one of you guys. Are you surprised that no one ended up playing the, the role long term? Oh, man, that's a tough question to answer. Um, I, I don't know if I'm really surprised for the simple fact that so many, so much changes up there so quickly. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, like, you know, something's hot right now and then tomorrow it's not. It, it's kind of the, the way it seemed. Um, so you, you just never know. I, I mean, uh, we thought it was a great gimmick. You know, I, I and, you know, I, that's great that you, you thought it was as well and, you know, a lot of other people did. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, who's in charge and, and the, the writers and all of that, you know, they decide on, on what uh, you know should should be done. So, yeah. and, and I think on our side as well, like I was saying before, that you got to take care of the business that you're doing, so that so that they'll want to continue using it. And I think sometimes maybe we didn't do that, so we could have done a better job at that. And and maybe they would have ran with it longer, or at least spun it off and done some more with it. You know, you never know. Absolutely. I just, I just actually saw, well, I went with my brother uh, to see Andrew Dice Clay uh, in August in Atlantic City, so you can give you an idea of, of why I'm, uh, I've always been a fan of the gimmick. Um, oh, absolutely. There's just something, you know what I think the thing is, and I think that you actually, and from watching the two of you actually play the role down to the O's and the whole nine yards, is the fact that, you know, people who don't get him don't get that it's supposed to be a satire and it's supposed to almost be mocking, you know, greasers in a way. And the way you played it, too, I remember, again, I watched your debut this morning when you guys first showed up. I thought the coolest thing that you had done was, uh, you know, you accused one of the one of the, the preliminary guys of, uh, you know, of, of looking at your girlfriend. And, and it was all comical and ha, 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 and stand back. And then out of nowhere, you came running across and just slammed him in the head with it. And I thought what you guys did terrifically was you were able to take kind of that, the comedy that almost with the ultimate, uh, that the Honky Tonk Man did as kind of that 50s, like, oh, I think it's the 50s type of gimmick. But there was that mean streak and that angry kind of, you know, outsiders type of way of, uh, uh, you know, of attacking guys and just, uh, you know, suddenly taking it from comedy to violence very quickly. Yeah, that was, that was by design. I mean, that was one thing that we definitely wanted it to be. I mean, especially Domino was, uh, you know, he was very adamant about that he didn't want it to be comical. Uh, just comedy. He's like, I don't want it to just be comedy. You know, there's got to be that that aggression in it. And um, so I was like, Yeah, let's let's do it. You know, let's go. I, I mean, I always felt much more comfortable being a heel type of character. Anyway, mm -hmm. it just uh, it just seemed to fit me better. So you know, when we when we did this gimmick and stuff, and we would have fun, and it would be funny, and and you know, we do all this teasing, ha ha, whatever. But when it came down to business, it was like, all right, the switch turned on in it, and now it was street, and we were just going to beat the crap out of somebody. And um, I think uh, one of the, the people that it w was uh, also instrumental in, in making sure that we did that was Arn Anderson. Mm -hmm. You know, he was very adamant about that. He's like, let's, you know, you gotta, you gotta, you can kill people when when the time comes. So, 
you know, because they, they look at us and it's, you know, you look at the gimmick, you're like, okay, yeah, 50s, outsiders, grease, and all of that. But, uh, you know, we wanted to be able to turn it on and, and just, uh, you know, be rough and tough when the time came. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah, it was it was almost taking it to that next level. It really, you know, I think, and to this day, I mean, it still feels, I think, for a lot of people, like it's an unfinished thing. And, and I personally, I don't think that you guys, uh, you know, I, I think if there's any team that, that has a, a good possibility of being brought back and continuing, I think you guys would, would be at the top of that list. Uh, but if, if you don't return to WWE, obviously people probably ask you, every time you run into anybody who, who knows you from WWE, Probably ask about TNA. You know, every, every time somebody leaves WWE, it's always the first question: well, When are you going to TNA? Uh, so, what are your thoughts about TNA? Do you watch them? Do you, do you, what do you think about it? And, and is that something that, that you would like to uh, like to be a part of? Yeah, I'd love to be a part of TNA. I mean, I think um, you know, I I wasn't sure when they first started up. I was, you know, I, I was hoping for them. I was like, man, uh, hopefully these guys can you know do something. Just. Uh, just because it gives a lot of the boys opportunities to to work somewhere else, and then you know they just kept going. And uh, when I got my release from WWE, I think that happens with a lot of the guys. Is you know one of their first stocks is all right. You know how about TNA? And um, I actually one of the the first things I wanted to do was to go to Japan, go back to Japan, and, and wrestle over there. And um, and then you know TNA was uh, was a thought as well. So yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to work for those guys and see, you know, see what the the opportunities would be like. But I mean, my ultimate though is is to is to go back to WWE. I don't I don't feel finished there yet either. You know, like you were talking about the gimmick, not it didn't feel like it get finished. I I don't feel like I finished off either. Uh, I feel like there's still a lot more I need to to do in this business, and still a lot more I have to offer. And uh, so I'd like to go back and finish that out. I think that's one of the good things, too, is that you're one of those guys that, you know, you got released, but there's no crazy scandalous stories behind it. You know, you just kind of left the company. So, you know, it doesn't seem like the, the kind of door that, that was closed shut. No, I hope not. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I mean, they gave me some great opportunities and, you know, let me uh, let me do my thing out there. And uh, then, you know, we, we came to a point where there was really nothing for me at that point. So... You know, they they released me, and so now, you know, I had to take a step back and think to myself, all right, so do I want to keep doing this or do I need to move on? You know, you got to be a little bit realistic with yourself and figure out what it is you need to do. And so I had that conversation with myself and thought about it, and I was like, no, you know, I, 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 don't, feel, I don't feel done yet. I mean, I didn't start wrestling um, for the... I stayed away from it and didn't start for this exact reason that I didn't want it to just be mediocre. I didn't just want to, you know, go and, like you're saying, nobody connected with me, nobody remembered me. I wanted it to be something worthwhile, you know, because I, my my dad was there and I, I represent him, I represent my family's name and um, I wanted to make something of it. So, I, I don't feel like I've accomplished that yet, so you know I'm gonna gonna keep doing uh, what I can and keep training and keep getting better and better, and hopefully that opportunity is gonna open up again. And when it does, I'll be ready. No, absolutely. I think also too. I, I think a lot of the fans kind of see it almost as a foregone conclusion because I mean the name, as you said before, the fact that, and again, not not the fact that you use the name as your gimmick, but the fact that you know your name is kind of synonymous with you know almost loyalty to WWE and, and kind of, it's almost the brand. I mean, when people, when I run into people who don't, you know, older people who don't watch wrestling anymore, the first thing they ask me is, you know, Hulk Hogan and Jimmy Snuka, you know, are almost like neck and neck whenever I'm asked about it. So Snuka and WWE, uh, it almost seems like a foreground conclusion that, uh, that, that you will return there. Looking forward to it. I Absolutely. hope so. Last question I want to ask you. We ask all of our guests the same question. If you could choose anyone, Maybe somebody that you grew up watching uh, and you weren't in the same place with. Maybe somebody who was in a different company when you were with WWE. That you say, you know what, I wish I could work with this person. Or I could have worked with this person. Who would you pick? I actually have two. Okay. Um, that would be Don Morocco and Roddy Piper. Man. I, uh, you know, I grew up around, you know, seeing them work with my dad. And just hearing his stories, 
and what they were able to do and how they did it. And uh, I think, man, that would have that would have been such an opportunity to learn from two of the very, very best at what they do, and just to be able to work with them in the ring and to, uh, you know, just learn from them in that capacity would have been amazing. I mean, they, I, that's funny. I think a lot of people who, you know, everybody knows about Roddy Piper, but to go back on YouTube now and watch some of Don Morocco's old promos from back in, uh, you know, years gone by, and there, there was no one like him. He had a style that just the way he was able to ad lib and, and just get the crowd going was, was second to none. Yeah, he was awesome. Absolutely. Well, Sim, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk to us. And before I let you go, why don't you uh, speak directly to your fans? So what do you have to say to uh, to all the little uh, little deuces out there who have been following you since day one? Well, um, I think I'll go back first and say how much I appreciate uh, the fans that used to watch my father and, okay. you know, have watched him over the years because it was those fans and their emails and when I would run into them on the street or in restaurants or whatever and those fans are the ones that helped get me into the business because they would, you know, say how much they appreciated this, watching my dad do that or this or that and that started to stir something up in me and so, so grateful for those fans and then, you know, to, to get on TV and to have an opportunity to do that. Um, you know, follow in my dad's footsteps and then, you know, having my own fans now, um, so grateful for them, man. What a, what a huge difference they make. I mean, it's nothing like being in a show and hearing the, the fans, you know, boo or cheer or whatever it is that they do. And, uh, you know, so grateful for those guys because they, they really make it, they make a huge difference and, uh, so grateful for that. Excellent. Uh, Sim, I want to thank you again, man, for taking the time. It's been, it's been great talking to you today. Thank you.